any town is proud of its Olympians. And tiny Emmerville, in the New England district of New South Wales, with a population of just 500, is no exception. Sprinter Debbie Wells first represented Australia as a teenager at the Montreal Olympics and later at Moscow and Los Angeles Olympics. But you know, I wonder if this little town realises that it holds the bragging rights to an even greater legend. Well, I believe Tom Richard was born here in Emmerville, which was known as Vegetable Creek back in those days in 1882. And I dare say that Tom Richard's father could well have been here, digging here in these shafts, digging, sh uh, digging shafts from six o'clock in the morning till six o'clock in the afternoon, just to make a living out of tin. It was very hard, very hard times back in those days, and they had to work hard to make a living on tin, otherwise they just didn't survive. Well, Emmerville was a bustling town uh, back in the 1880s. There was nine hotels and there were three churches. And uh, each hotel had a union, union team, which was their relaxing time of a weekend when the men would pull their gumboots on and play union. Rugby was the thing in Emmerville. Like most small towns around Australia, Emmerville has its war memorial, complete with the names of those who volunteered from this area. But the name of Emmerville's most remarkable son isn't here. For by the time he enlisted, he had long moved away. But over the next 35 years, the man born here would become the only man to represent both Australia and the United Kingdom in rugby union, and eventually, the trophy for Wallaby British Lion contests would be named after him. He would win a gold medal at the 1908 Olympic Games in London and then win the military cross for conspicuous gallantry on the battlefields of France. Richards grew up to be an athletic young man, and his speed, strength and intelligent play led to his selection in the Queensland team in 1905 as a breakaway. His light brown hair led to the nickname of Rusty. That same year, his father, still chasing a fortune on new gold fields, travelled across the Indian Ocean to the Transvaal province of South Africa. Joining him the following year, Rusty was soon playing in the Curry Cup competition. His name was in the mix for selection for the Springboks tour to Britain, but he was ruled ineligible for selection. So he went to England in the hope of playing against them. The dream was realised. Playing for Gloucestershire, he was in a warm-up match against the Springboks. Hearing that an Australian team might tour England, he returned to Queensland where his performances ensured his selection for the 1908 tour. The first ever tour of Britain by the Australians was where they gained the name Wallabies. Behind me, where these buildings are now, was once the White City Stadium, where many of the main events of the 1908 London Olympic Games were staged. Rugby was then an Olympic sport, and the Wallabies met the champion county side Cornwall, which represented England, to play for the gold medal on the 26th of October. Richard scored another try in the comprehensive 32-3 win, and so became an Olympic gold medalist. 
Richards returned to South Africa and in 1910, an injury ravaged British Lions team called him up as his time playing for British clubs qualified him. He played in 12 games, including the first two tests. He remains the only man to have played for the Wallabies and the British Lions. Richards played more rugby in Australia, Britain and France and played a test for Australia against an All-American side in 1912. He retired from rugby in 1913, returning to Australia to work as a journalist. When Australia found itself at war with Germany in 1914, the call for volunteers drew Richards. He enlisted in the Australian Imperial Force, the AIF in August 1914, and was allocated as a stretcher bearer in the first field ambulance. Richards kept a very detailed diary of his time in the AIF. Not only does it tell us a lot about his activities, it is also a fascinating insight into his own soul. Richards recorded his own journey and emotional struggles in this very intimate picture of his heart. In order to learn more about Richards, we are going to get some insights from Dr. Daniel Renault, Associate Professor of History at Avondale University, who has read Richards' diary as part of his research. Daniel, what do we learn about Tom from his war diaries? Well, I think it's one of the most interesting diaries I've ever read, and having read many. Uh, first of all, we get a really complex character coming through. He's a very detailed writer, a very prolific writer, and a writer who explores not just what he does or what he sees, but how he feels about it. And, and what we learn is he's kind of volunteered to join the army, but at the same time, he's not fully convinced that it's a just cause. He kind of feels like he ought to be doing more for the war. He's a medic, he's a stretcher bearer, but he feels he really should be in combat, but he's opposed to, to war. He doesn't like the officers, in fact, tries to get out of being a, a, a lance corporal because he doesn't want the responsibility, yet feels bad about not doing that. And he ends up becoming an officer in a combat unit and winning a military cross for bravery. So all of these incredible tensions in his life. Now, the other really interesting feature of his diary, which you hardly ever see, is his really detailed descriptions of his own spiritual journey. He uses his diary to put down his thoughts on God and faith and church. Fascinating journey that he's on. He's quite cynical, quite cynical about the, the British cause. He recognises that it's not a clear-cut goodies versus baddies, British versus the nasty Hun. Um, and yet, he still joins up. He still participates. But all the way through in his diaries, he's aware that this is ambiguous, that, that war isn't this clean good versus bad. He's a man of quite a bit of world experience. He's traveled a lot, and he certainly doesn't relate to a lot of his fellow Anzacs. He feels different from them. Remember, he's come from a very working class background, and he's kind of worked himself up in society, and he's very conscious of being different. A woman continued to wave her handkerchief enthusiastically to give us encouragement on our voyage of legalised murder. The whole business seems almost unbelievable. Church service was held at 11.30 when the chaplain tried to justify the Allies' position and asked God for protection and deliverance. The irony of it all, such hypocrisy. Surely this great God, if he has the power to influence victory in any particular way, would also have the power to prevent it at the very first and before lives were sacrificed. It seems to be a difference that man alone can settle and might takes precedence over right. 
Richards really objected to the idea that God was on one side or another in this war. Now, when the chaplain preached a sermon that it, it was going to be God rather than the French or the Russians who destroy the German army, he wrote in his diary, this does not savour of the way a righteous God should act. After training, Richard sailed for Europe on board the troop ship Euripides, part of the huge convoy that carried the Australian and New Zealand forces. He had fun teasing a colleague who asked the identity of a dish of pickled pork. Veal, said Richards, which was good enough for his friend who ate it with a clear conscience. The troop ship was diverted to Egypt and the Australians disembarked and were taken to a camp outside of Cairo. Richards was involved in helping set up the YMCA Recreation Hut, which was the venue not only for quiet relaxation and letter writing, but also concerts and lectures for the troops. Look, there are lots of things on, on Richard's mind at the moment. Um, his brother's been killed in a mining accident in South Africa. His mother's returned to Australia. Uh, his dad is unwell. He's quite concerned about the conflict he's having with his father about religion. His father really is pushing him in a particular direction. But Richard's is struggling with a very formalised religion. He wants something dynamic but deep at the same time. In April, the Anzacs were packed onto ships and they sailed for the islands off the Turkish peninsula of Gallipoli. On the evening of the 24th of April, they prepared for the landings the next day. Tonight, although the fellows are naturally a little excited, they are in good spirits. There has been a stronger tendency for sacred music also of late, with mouth organ and concertina. Only a few minutes ago they were playing and singing Nearer My God to Thee and Lead Kindly Light. It's wonderful how religion gets them down when there is danger about. This ordeal should also test and bring my lack of faith home to me and give me new light in that direction as I walk blindly and aimlessly now. This is the fateful beach at Anzac Cove. Daniel, tell us about Tom Richards and what he would have experienced right here. Well, on the morning of the 25th, he was on his ship out in the harbour here. And about 8.30, he got down into the boats that were bringing the men ashore. He would have been hearing gunfire since the dawn. And as he got closer, he would have seen men on the beach and perhaps running up the hills behind us. The first thing he did when he landed was to pull out his camera and take seven photographs. He shouldn't have had a camera. Uh, soldiers were not supposed to be uh, taking snaps, especially in a battle. But there was his journalistic instincts from before the war coming out. And then uh, in the afternoon, he was helping load the boats with wounded soldiers who were being taken out to the ships. And over the next few days, he was moving up Shrapnel Gully behind us and bringing the wounded down to the beach. How does his spirituality hold up in the heat of battle? Well, it does hold up. He keeps noting spiritual things in his diary. He often records church services, which he wants to share with his father, knowing how much his father would enjoy having that subject discussed. But of course, in the first few weeks of the battle here, there are no services held. Many of the chaplains are still on board the ships. They're dealing with the many wounded that are there. And uh, so there's not much to write about at first. On the 24th of May, he writes about Chaplain Mackenzie, 
the famous Scotsman who conducted many of the burial services during the truce when they, they buried the thousands of Turkish dead from the battle a few days earlier. And then he records the very first church service on the 13th of June that Mackenzie holds in a bowl of hills up behind us there and uh, hearing the men sing as the sun sets over the Mediterranean and a shell came along and exploded over the service and knocked over a few men. But fortunately, the injuries were slight. The church service was held spellbound and silent for the few minutes that the above drama was being enacted. And the prayer concluded, they all rose and sang, abide with me. Parson Andrews went on explaining the beauty of St Paul's letter to the misbelieving people of Corinth. Punctuated here and there by the callous bursting of shrapnel shells, before we rose for the final hymn, the casualties numbered five. Bad enough in all truth, but still an astoundingly small total considering the number of shells. So this location played an important role in the course of the battle. Yes, this is Wire Gully. Now, where we're standing didn't exist. It was much lower. And uh, this hill came down either side into this very steep gully that was too steep to dig trenches. So they just put barbed wire there to create the front line. Now, on the 19th of May, the Turks launched their major counterattack to drive the Australians back into the sea and they're moving from this direction up to the hills here to hit Quinn's Post and Steele's Post. But across Wire Gully, no cover at all. And the Australians here mow them down line after line, hundreds of men killed and wounded at this spot. Now, the Australians are here and they're also suffering some casualties from the Turks as they're attacking. Now, was Tom Richards involved in any of this? Yes. He's here just right at the Australian lines and he's taking the Australian wounded from this battle down to the aid post. In fact, he's so heavily involved and so conspicuously involved that the general who writes the report of the battle mentions him by name. It's called a mentioned in dispatches and it indicates particularly distinguished service. So Richards plays an important role here. He does. In fact, let's go down and have a look where he worked. So this is where Richards would have been based? Yes, this is 4th Battalion Parade Ground. It's just below Wire Gully. It's a semi-sheltered spot where they could bring the wounded. And as you can see, some of the men who died are buried here. I wonder how he must have felt amongst all this death and carnage. Well, it's his usual mixed emotions. He's been writing, hopefully, to a couple of girls in Australia. He finds out they've got married. He's worried that he's becoming cynical and negative. He wants to live up to his ideals. He hears a sermon about purity that, that makes him feel better. He feels sick at heart at these good men who've been killed. And he hears another sermon that really challenges him and inspires him. The preacher attacked the Australia for the Australians mob by telling them they were awfully swelled headed and thought only of their own achievements, belittling foolishly those of the Tommy. I am not in the humour to deal in detail with this remarkable service, but suffer me to say that it raised considerable discussion amongst the boys, but it will do them quite a lot of good as we are hardly broad minded and fair enough to our opponents or even our friends. It sounds like this sermon made a real impression on him. He's struggling with spiritual issues here. He certainly is. He's wrestling with a whole lot of things. Now, he's evacuated from Gallipoli with malaria, and this gives him time and space to think. And he gets angry with a preacher whose sermon tried to scare soldiers into obeying God with threats of punishment. 
It's not the God he recognises. On the other hand, he doesn't like the way religions compete against each other when they all claim to serve the same God. What he's looking for is religion that's intelligent, that's practical and relevant to everyday life. And he particularly finds a connection through music to God. In 1916, the Australians moved to the battlefields of France. While the countryside behind the lines was idyllic and beautiful, the front lines were places of boredom, punctuated by periodic violence and unpredictable death. In December 1916, Richards was commissioned as a lieutenant and became a combat officer in the 1st Battalion. Daniel, what does this mean? Well, it's part of the complexity of his character. He doesn't like officers, but he becomes one because he wants to improve his lot in life. He doesn't really agree with the war, but he becomes a combat officer. Now, as a platoon commander, he's in charge of about 40 men, and at first, He's not really comfortable in that role. He's not sure of what he's doing, but he gradually grows in competence and confidence. Then at the Second Battle of Bullcourt on the 4th of May, he leads his platoon along a German trench. Now he's a bomber, which means that he and his men are carrying bags of hand grenades and they're dropping them in the bunkers. They're throwing them around the corners of the trench, clearing the German line. And then having done that, build a barricade, and throw bombs to prevent the Germans from recapturing it. For this excellent work, he's decorated with the military cross. And did he continue his interest in spiritual things? Yes, he did. But his diary records things that are similar to other people who went to the front line. The references to religion and spirituality drop while they're in the front trenches. Their mind is actually occupied with survival. But Richards is still asking questions. He's investigating. He's still trying to find what it is that he's searching for in life. The English preacher was in attendance today to administer unto our sinfulness. And he put up a jolly good showing too. He took Christianity in a broad sense and clinched his arguments well down. He didn't hold himself up as an example. He knew his shortcomings only too well, but it's Christ's purity, his holiness that I want to impress upon you. Thomas Rusty Richards. He's remembered now every time the Wallabies and British and Irish Lions meet. Yet his story as an Anzac hero also deserves remembering. And perhaps above that, was his own constant spiritual quest for meaning in life. For all of his wandering and flaws, Richards remained committed to trying to discover who God is and how we can best worship him. If you'd like to find out more about trusting Jesus and find that real hope that the Anzacs found during the challenges of war, if you'd like to experience how God is with us even during our darkest and most difficult trials, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our incredible journey viewers today. It's the booklet, The Faith of the Anzacs. I guarantee that these stories will lift your spirits and lead your thoughts to a faith that works in the trials and tests of life. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make sure you take this wonderful opportunity to receive the free gift we have for you today. 
Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or 770-800-0266 in the United States or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. You can also write to us at GPO Box 274 Sydney, New South Wales 2001 Australia or PO Box 76673 Manukau, Auckland 2241 New Zealand or PO Box 888717 Atlanta, Georgia 30356 USA. You can also email us at info at tij.tv. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed our journey through the life and times of Tom Richards, from Emmerville to Gallipoli and then on to London, and our reflections on what faith in God really means, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, let's pray to the same God that the Anzacs did. Dear Heavenly Father, we remember the battles, physical, emotional and spiritual, that Tom Richards fought during his time on Gallipoli and in France. We honour his commitment to spiritual searching and pray that we may also have the courage to look for faith, to seek out and find a real faith in God. Please bless us and our families. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.